for our speaker this morning, Dadara. He's going to talk about the art of mind. Word here am I? Okay, for the rest I'm gonna continue in English. I'm gonna say good morning to everyone and uh, I'm gonna talk, as you heard, about money. And money is a subject which totally changed my life in the past two years. So two years ago, I was an artist, and then I decided to become a bank director. Okay. And one small change, which you maybe don't know, but the fact that I'm saying good morning now, I don't have a watch, but I think it's 9 a.m. Two years ago, I knew, theoretically, there were people awake before 10, 11 a.m., but in practice, I was sleeping. But now I'm saying good morning. Uh, life of a bank director is pretty different than that of an artist. And uh, the topic of this talk is, as said, money. And it would be good to know if anybody here knows what I'm talking about. So, first, a small question. Did anybody in this room ever use money? Yes. Uh, I guess some people don't dare to raise their finger. But uh, that's, that's what's really amazing about money, that everybody in this planet, or almost everybody, uses money every single day. So far, there are still more money users than Facebook users. But what's also amazing that even though everybody uses money every single day, we give very little thought to what it actually is, how it works, and how it maybe might work in a totally different way. Because after all, money is just a tool. I mean, most of you probably have an iPhone or Photoshop or whatever, and tools get changed, refined, redefined all the time. But money somehow is a fixed entity, and we, but now what we see <coughs> happening recently is that we start thinking a little bit about what money is, and that maybe indeed it might change and become a total different tool. Um, what I'll first explain a little bit is the project I started, because you heard that I became a bank director, maybe you're wondering like what's happening here. Well, what I did two years ago, I started my own bank. It was a time when governments had no money for art, but they had billions to bail out banks, so it seemed like a good idea at that time to do it. And at the same time, uh, this is actually the, it's a traveling bank booth. Here we are in the Boymans Museum in Rotterdam. We were also in the Stedelijk Museum, the Rijksmuseum. Part of the places where we pop up are very cultural. Because the project started from a very art perspective. As you can see my suit, I mean, down there I'm still an artist. I'm slowly fading into a bank director. Uh, I don't know where it's, where it's eventually going to end up. But art, for me, has always been like the most important thing in my life. And as an artist, you have a very, as they say, intrinsic motivation of doing things. The only reason to do things is because you feel you do, you need to do them. It's not, there is no real logical reason, although feeling is very logical. But uh, what I already noticed at an early age is in our society, that's for most people not the reason to do things. And there was this other thing called money. So somehow there always was, I always saw the world as this giant playground. You could do whatever you wanted. I mean, make amazing things, create very playful, colorful stuff. But at the same time, it wasn't just a playground, it was a parking lot as well. So you had to keep throwing money in the parking meter, otherwise you would get towed away. So there was, there was this friction with money. And to be honest, and that's a much bigger change than that I'm saying, like, look, it's 9 a.m. and I'm awake. The biggest change that occurred within me with this project was my change of attitude towards money. So I come from a very anti-money background. I think I'm not the only artist who has that. And as we'll see at the end of this talk, I think money can even be love. Um, I'll talk about that later. Um, another thing about art is that, uh, and there was another reason for doing this project, for me, art is very important. It has a lot of value. But when you look at newspapers, at the media, when will you ever read about art? It's when a Picasso gets sold for 100 million, Cezanne card players get sold for 250 million, even a, what is it, the Lehman Bank, 
they will go bankrupt and their collection gets sold. It's front page news. But you can really wonder, what does that say about the value of art? What's interesting about it? Does it have any influence on the art world? Is there any spiritual value to it? So that's where it started. This whole project started from an arts perspective. But then I started looking at money, studying what it is. When I paint, I use acrylic paints, so I need to know how acrylics work. For 10 years, I destroyed all my work, so I needed to, for instance, find out how do explosives work. And now I needed to find out what is money. And then uh, the big thing that changed is that, now, as a true bank director, I became obsessed by money. So that's already a change, going from anti-money to an obsession. And money is a really weird thing. Uh, there is, it's not been by, backed by any tangible assets like gold or anything for over 40 years. It's, it's hardly tangible at all. It's only 3% of our transactions are still physical. It's just information. We do also live in an information age. But it's just an agreement, and when we would use it as an agreement and all use it together, I feel it actually would be something that we could use to build communities together. And as I ask this, it's kind of a lame question to ask, did you ever use money? But it shows that since everybody is using it, I feel we could very much use it to unite each other. But at the moment, you see, it's the 1% versus the 99%. It's something that very much divides. So our bank doesn't only pop up in uh, art places. But this is, for instance, Amsterdam Central Station. And what can people do at our bank? They can exchange their money. It's a traveling exchange booth. We have bank notes of zero, million, infinite. So you can exchange your money for something that maybe has more value. We also went to Occupy. We even went to shopping centers. And there's another very interesting place we went to. This is a desert. It's in Nevada. It's a festival called the Burning Man Festival. And what's really interesting, when we look at it from a money perspective uh, about Burning Man, and now I'm again going to ask you a question, a bit uh, less lame than the did you ever use money. Did any anyone here ever not use money for an entire week? Okay, oh, there are three people. Can I ask why? Or where did you not use money for an entire week? Okay. <laughs> So we can see that there is actually in our society not using money for a week or not being confronted with money is very special and it's, I feel it's a way to open up yourself to maybe different possibilities of money. But what I also noticed, I've done a lot of projects at this festival, is that for most people they don't see it as a way to rethink our society or money. For them it's just a vacation of money. So. I mean, they go out to the desert, but before going to the desert, they max out their credit card totally. They rent an expensive RV, buy lots of food, everything. They just keep spending, spending. Then for a week, there is no money. But then on the way back, uh, they already check their phone, like, is there mobile reception? Because, hey, I need to pay my mortgage. Did they already pay my salary? But instead, what we thought was interesting to do is bring money to that place. And obviously, since there is no money, it's not allowed there. It's also based on the gift economy, another concept which I'll talk about. Uh, so we could not do it like we do at Central Station, that people exchange their money. So what we tried to do was make people aware how they use money the other 51 weeks of the year. And since money is not real, I mean, it's basically nothing. It's just an agreement. So in exchange, it does have value. And I think it's very important when we use money that we always realize it is an exchange. When we buy something, it's not just about greed and having. When you go to a shop, we always think like, okay, we buy something, we buy coffee, we buy stuff. But it's not entirely true. It's not a one-way transaction because we give something back. We give money back. And by thinking to whom we give money back, that's, I feel, a big way how we can influence our society and make it become more like we want it to be. So when you drink coffee somewhere, I mean, you can go to a big chain like Starbucks or whatever, and get coffee, and I mean, you will get coffee, but where do you give your money? Or does it add any value to your neighborhood, social value? Or you could also choose, and this is just a very simple example, to go to this local cool coffee shop, which is doing amazing stuff, and buy your coffee there. Because not only will it get you coffee, you will also add a lot of value to your neighborhood, you will build communities. And so what did people have to do at Burning Man? They had to realize whenever they did uh, they had done stuff which was not good for their karma, so maybe they used money in a wrong way. Then they could sign a spiritual karma laundering contract, bringing their spiritual karma debt back to zero, and they would get a 
zero banknote from us. So as I mentioned before, at our bank you can exchange your money. Um, this is one of the banknotes, it's zero. And all of these banknotes, they deal with value. This whole project is looking at values of art and money, and also how we attach our values to money, and also how the way one money works influences the way we think. Because when on a banknote it says zero, then you have to assign your own value to it. And not all values, I mean, it might be a surprise to you, but there are more values than just financial values there social values, spiritual values, emotional values, and I think all of them are really important. But in our society somehow, I think, like we had the alchemists for hundreds of years, they were looking for the philosopher's stone. The great thing about the philosopher's stone was everything you would touch would turn into gold. Uh, to my knowledge, I don't think anyone ever found that stone, but we found money. And what money does, it also magically changes everything, like all the qualities we have of life, all these special values, they just get changed into a measurable pile of banknotes, or rather just a measurable uh, amount of digits. This is another banknote. It's uh, the million. And again, all, the, all the, the denominations of our banknotes, they deal with value. So a million, because in our society there's this magic ring about a million. Everybody wants to be a millionaire. And then again, when we look at what money is nowadays, it's, it really is nothing, it's not backed by anything, it's just information, it's something, an agreement that has value in exchange. But instead, we don't want to exchange and use it, we want to hoard it on our bank accounts, we want to have a lot. It's really cool to be a millionaire. And I mean, you can wonder what you have. You have a bunch of zeros and ones, and then you go through your account on iSafe or whatever, you log in on the internet, and suddenly it's not there anymore, but you can wonder if you ever had anything. And uh, another way, it's also interesting to look at our money system. It's not that I say that I know better than other people how it should work, but I think we should question uh, the whole system. And for instance, there is this aspect of interest. When money gets created nowadays, it's created out of interest. When we keep it on our bank accounts, we get interest to not use it. And now that we can also see there are actually people are starting to experiment with other monetary systems and a lot of them, they use negative interest even. And negative interest is meant to stimulate exchange, that you don't keep it, but keep using it. And I think it's very, it's very good to realize that it's a tool and we, I mean, the, the way it works now might be a good way. It might even be just a good way for a certain community and as different communities, I mean, we might need different ways of money. For instance, I have a, I mean, obviously I have a mobile phone, I don't need to show it because it's there. Uh, but say, for instance, I want to make a phone call now, but I won't have reception here because there's this seller and it doesn't work. Then I go like, you know what, I don't have a good phone provider. I have to change my phone provider, find one that will work here. But now I have another problem. I'm working with euros and I think they don't work well. I mean, they don't serve my community. And now I want to find another money provider. Well, I have a problem. This is, uh, again, another banknote, the infinite. And again, it deals, it, this appeals to our greed, like everybody would like to have an infinite amount of money. Because what do we think? We think when we have an infinite amount of money, that will solve all our problems, and then we can focus on doing what we really want to do. And somehow we always get taught, uh, I think most parents have taught our uh, kids, like first, you need to get financial security, find a good job, and then later, uh, preferably when you're retired, you can do whatever you want, start following your dreams. Um, uh, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I'm not a, a religious person, but I do have a feeling and sense that we are all here for a certain purpose. And maybe as an artist, you feel that you need to do certain things, but it's not limited to artists. I think everybody deep down inside themselves, they know what they really want to do. And then, I mean, you don't do it, or a lot of people don't do it because of money, and I go, but then you look, you can look back on your life and, uh, I mean, what's interesting did you, that you can say, like, look, for 20 years I've been earning money and it's all gone anyway, or for 20 years I've been doing what I really, really want to do and what my dreams are. I think a big lesson that I learned uh, about it was around 12 years ago I built a big ship in the Netherlands, a, a wooden three-master, I shipped it to the United States and I burned it in the desert. And uh, my accountant for three years, I think, was convinced that I was a total nutcase. 
I mean, and I barely survived, but when I look back now, and what's the best, I think it was around 40,000 what I spent, what the best money is that I ever spent, I feel it's that. Because for that money, I could have bought a really cool car. I mean, that car in 12 years time would have gone eroded anyway. But a nice thing about lessons learned and about special uh, adventures you have had is that the memory and the lessons, they just keep getting better over time. So they don't, they don't inflate. Might be my two cents, but still. This is another banknote. It's the 2012 banknote. As it says here, uh, it has an expiration date of the 21st of December 2012. Uh, I used to talk about it in a different way, but now we know that the world didn't end. At least, uh, I mean, I guess this is not a dream, this is real what's happening. Uh, but that date, never, I never believed that it was the end of the world. I actually was hoping it would be an important date in a shift in consciousness. But what's interesting about it, okay, so now this expiration date is gone, it's not worth, it has no financial value anymore, but it's still art. So maybe its value is bigger. And this is again a banknote. Uh, this one, I, I never managed to memorize that, so 011000. It's binary, it's computer language for art. And what I mentioned before, like nowadays, our money, most of the money is just digits. It's information, it's hardly tangible anymore. What's interesting about this one, all the banknotes you see, we printed them, uh, just smaller size with details in silver, gold, holographic fo foil. I mean, part of the question is, what is their value? Does the value lie in their beauty or uh, in their monetary value? So all of them are hand painted. That also adds something to the value. And this one is interesting because it has a QR code here which goes to the website of the project, and you can go to, uh, I mean, I'm not a stupid artist, I live in this age, so I know you can go to curify.com, get a QR code in three seconds probably. Well, this is what I did. It took me an entire day to paint the QR code, and it felt so good, because I think it's one of the most useless things you can do in our society nowadays, to take an entire day to do this, but it does really add value, because most people will not notice it, but sometimes you see people looking at it and they go like, you hand painted this? I think value added is not always about money or about what your hourly salary. Now we're going back to uh, the Nevada desert at Burning Man. This year I went there with another project which dealt with money. And I mentioned one thing, there is no money at Burning Man. But the other very interesting thing about Burning Man is that it's based on a gift economy. And a lot of people think, okay, there's no money, so that means you're bartering, you're exchanging stuff. That's not true either. It's just about giving. And gift economy is very interesting because in our society, we somehow always think when you give something, you need to get something back. I mean, money is a way which really materialized, made it official. But with a gift economy, I mean, you just give stuff, you give whatever, you give services, you give material gifts, and you don't know where you'll or if you'll ever give, get them back. You give unconditionally. But the interesting thing is you will get an amazing amount back, but it's a different kind of circulation. It's not that I give you something and you give me something back, but it's, it's more kind of a circular movement. And it's also, it's a whole different way of working, and it's not only about money, but the, the value it adds is incredible. For instance, this is a tree I bu built in the desert. I'll talk later about the tree. But to build it there, I had a crew of 10 people. We, had to, we were working two weeks in Reno, so we had to stay somewhere. So somebody gave us two apartments, and actually that person also made sure that there was a new bottle of Jack Daniels every day. It really seemed to worry him if there was no Jack Daniels. Uh, we were working in a hacker space, maker space, so we could use all their tools, we could use their space, we got a trailer, we got a truck. And then when I explained it to people, uh, I could explain, and that's when people mostly just understand it, when I explain like, okay, so that means we saved so many thousands of dollars or euros. But that's not the most valuable part about it. The most valuable part is that working in such a way gives the whole project a different character. People put different energy into it, and people will also see it in a different way. I also, a lot of the projects I do, and I've been doing uh, projects for 20 years now, I work with a lot of people, I mean, and for some people I will pay plane tickets, other people I will pay all the costs, some people I will pay a very basic salary. 
And 10 years ago, 15 years ago, even friends of mine with companies, they would tell me like, Daniel, this is such a hell how you're working. Because not only, uh, I mean, you're working with people, but everybody of them, you have to stay friends with them. You have to treat them well. I mean, because that's in our society, pay someone a salary, have a contract, and you can, I mean, you don't need to, but if you want, you can treat them like shit. And if the next day they don't show up, you go like, hey, I pay you a salary. You have to do this. But now I see it as two advantages, because A, you can do things for much less money, and B, you develop amazing relationships. But yes, you will have to put a lot of energy into these relationships, because you, it's not just about money, it's about different social values. And sometimes with projects, I'm awake 40 hours, and before somebody would come to me because they wanted something from me, and I would go like, you know what, I'm going to sleep now. I never do that anymore because that meant a year of coffee drinking and solving uh, problems. So now I go like, okay, I already didn't sleep for 40 hours, one hour more, it doesn't hurt. You drink a glass of wine with that person, you get amazing new ideas, and it just it has benefits. Uh, in a commercial situation, you would say win-win. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the tree we build in the desert. It's the transfer money tree, and this tree has leaves from its branches. The leaves are the bank notes from the Exchange Exhibition Bank. It's looking at a possible new way of money. Also maybe a future, as I mentioned, with the different money providers, where we could work with different kinds of money, suitable for different communities, different situations. And the tree itself, the trunk, we asked people for money, for banknotes. We actually didn't ask them for money, for banknotes. And what did we do with those banknotes? We glued them onto the tree. I did a lot of tests, I found a certain wood glue that works perfect, so all the money that's on there, it can never come off anymore. And uh, the other interesting thing is that since we dealt with physical banknotes and not our virtual form of money, people could draw, paint, write on the money, turn it into art, and then it would get glued on the tree. And some people would say, like, hey, you're destroying all that money. And again, that's not entirely true, maybe some people think that. But it's again looking at what are the most important values, what's, how do we appreciate certain values. And OK, the, the money on the tree has lost its financial value, but it did get another value in return. The tree is very thought provoking, it's very beautiful. And I mean, for instance, here there's a 100 euro bill. And people, when they see it, they go like, whoa, that's, but I mean, it's not, it's just a piece of paper this big, and actually it's glued on a tree. There's all kind of paint and uh, stuff on there. And I mean, and some banknotes are 10 baht, others are 20 euro, 20 dollar. And I've been thinking about, and it was very tempting to count how much money there was on the tree. I did not do that. Because I think the amount of money on this tree does not say anything about its value. The whole value, sometimes in our society, money quantifies everything. It puts a number on everything. And I think we should be able to appreciate other values more, and maybe sometimes just feel those values and be content with the fact that we know that it's really worth something, even if we can't put a number on it. If you have a spiritual experience, if there's a great social community, I mean, how do you put a number on that? You can go like, okay, I went to the spiritual special travel package and I paid 5,000 euros for it, so it's more spiritual than the one I paid 3,000 euros for. Well, I mean, that's not my two cents. Um, here are some examples of banknotes which people made. And again, you can, you can wonder what's more valuable, the one where it was still money or the banknotes where it became art. This one is interesting, it's 1,000 yen, and that person even wrote on there like it's, what is it, 10.3 euros, 12.94 US dollars. And it's just, uh, this has nothing really to do with the whole topic of, uh, of money, but uh, it's, it's just nice to show the environments because besides the fact that there is no money and it's a gift economy and everything, I mean, uh, a sandstorm like this is priceless. <coughs> I would not know how to put money on, uh, on that. And then everybody who um, would, it was a very interesting exchange, the tree, because people would um, write, draw on a banknote, then give us the banknote, we would glue it on a tree, and they would get this banknote in return. It's money 2.0. And 2.0, uh, I guess you are familiar with the term, it's obviously it comes from internet. It's where you as a user also have influence on the content, on the way it works. So it's not just that money is this given thing from above and you can only use it this way. 
No, we, it's a tool, so why can't we as a community also think about ways to use it? And for instance, there are, I don't know if you know about complementary currencies, that some communities are starting their own money. There is, for instance, time banking, which means we don't have money where it's about one euro, two euro, five euros, but it's about time. So you have bank notes of an hour, bank notes of 15 minutes, and as we can see now, there are more and more countries where people are unemployed, they have very little money, but most of the people have a lot of time. And most of the neighborhoods where people are unemployed are bad neighborhoods. But what if suddenly these people would exchange a lot of services together? So somebody paints somebody else's house, gets paid four hours, goes to somebody else who can hairdress or goes to daycare, and then suddenly you have this whole community where everybody's working together, the community has, I mean, is becoming booming, and still everybody is poor in euros. But again, what, why does it matter if you're poor in euros if you can do whatever you want? It's again a choice, do you want to just do whatever you want and live your dreams or be rich? Uh, money 2.0, it also says there, but even long after money will be gone, nature will still be there and we will still be able to pick things of real value from trees. Um, what's, yeah, as I said, this project, it's interesting when you try to make or uh, provoke change in society. Change is also 2.0, it's not a one-way thing, so it changes you as well. And this project changed me a lot. I mean, not only did I cut my uh, long hair and put on a suit and tie and wake up in the morning, I'm also, for instance, working with real banks. Beginning of this year, for a week, I was an artist in residence at the ASN Bank. My new bank note, actually, I'll present at an event at the Abbey and Amro, and I think it's uh, I've given talks at Boom Festival, at Burning Man, at a lot of alternative places. But I think it's much more interesting that since everybody in this world uses money, to use money to bridge gaps between different kind of ways of thinking. And uh, I hope that money will become something that indeed can unite us, but also that we will have different ways of money. So now there's a money economy here, and for instance, I really love gift economy, but they don't really work together. But what if, and I'll show that, that's a new project we're doing, money economy could get more of the quality of a gift and those two could start cooperating. And in between, maybe we would have different kinds of other currencies. And you, I mean, different communities could use them in different ways. So what's the new um, project we're working on? So far, all the bank notes the Exchange Vision Bank issued also were numbers. So money, as I mentioned, it quantifies everything, but I actually also quantified everything with this project because zero, million, infinite, 2012, they all put numbers on things. So after coming back from Burning Man, I felt like I should make a banknote which has a value but not a monetary value. And the value of this banknote is love. That's the denomination. And that's a big change coming from anti-money and then uh, almost equaling money to love. And what's the whole idea behind this banknote? It's what I mentioned about spiritual karma laundering contracts, about the focus on exchange. When we buy something, don't, that we don't just buy it, but we realize to whom we give money back, and we only give money back to those people and initiatives we love and who do things with love as well. And this banknote is a way to materialize that love. So when you pay, uh, somewhere in a place that you really like and you really are conscious that, hey, I really want to pay here, you can add love to your payment. And um, there are various things that happened that I think made me think of this idea. One was that beginning of uh, last year, or I think around a year ago, I gave a talk at the Envision Festival in Costa Rica. And before giving that talk, as a kind of experiment, I thought like, hey, I'll take my money and I'll just go to all these different st stalls at the festival and try to pay with it. So for a zero, I would buy a cappuccino for... And I just went to these various places and then I realized how much fun it was to actually do this transaction because I would, for instance, go to a place, get cappuccino, and they would go like, no, we don't want zero for infinite, we can give you cappuccino. <laughs> and all these other people would also come there and there would be discussions and people would go like, what is this? It would be like, it really was fun to pay. But then, I mean, when you go to a shop, it's not that you give 10 euros, they go like, oh man, this is so cool that you gave me 10 euros and it's beautiful and where are you from? It's, no, I mean, it's, our transactions, they are kind of totally, they're not, money is not adding a personal, anything personal to transactions. And also it's, 
It's one of the qualities of the money system we have now, or qualities, it's just one of the aspects, is that it's very anonymous. And it does work for certain things, it works. If we want to buy something at Amazon, I mean, we don't need to add a lot of personal quality to it. But for building communities, it actually is important. And now is our money, it's, we don't even know. If I work together with someone, and I put energy into that person, I want to know what that person is, and if he does cool things, but if I pay someone money, I don't even know if they'll use that money to buy weapons or go to children's, pro uh, children's prostitute or whatever. And by adding love, it's like you make it personal. Uh, this is the other side of uh, love. It also said this bang out is personal and loving tender for all exchanges, private or public, as long as they're done with love. And uh, the other, uh, what I myself liked, is could love become the root of all money? Because now, we all heard the saying, uh, money is the root of all evil. And what's interesting is that when we would look in the Bible, it actually started different. It was for the love of money is the root of all evil. Somehow love uh, disappeared from the equation. And I think, what if we would turn it around and indeed use money, uh, use money with love? And um, I, don't, I actually don't know if I'm supposed to say uh, this, but uh, organizers of Creative Mornings, they went to the Exchange Exhibition Bank and they exchanged their money into love. So all of you are going to get uh, some love now. <laughs> but I'm going to say something as well, that uh, when you get that banknote, it's a gift. And I know it might be tempting to keep it and maybe frame it, but I feel that you should use it to add love to a payment for some person or initiative that you really like. So don't keep it, uh, spread the love. And then, uh, as a bank director, obviously, I should have a commercial message as well. <laughs> so, uh, there's a website, artasmoney.com. It, it's not only about the project. I mean, you can see a lot of things about the project, a lot of visual content. But we also have a blog where we ask people, various people, philosophers, artists, writers, economists, to write about value, about art, about money. So you can go deeper into the subject. I think art can be a great catalyst. It's, because a lot of people don't know about complementary currencies. And I think it's a fascinating area, but it looks really boring. But somehow with our suits and when we, with the money we use and performances, we can try to trigger people to maybe go inside that world. This map is actually the love map. The love banknote got issued like a week and a half ago. Uh, but uh, what we also ask people is when you do a transaction and you add love to your transaction, you can go and it says, on the, you can find out uh, on the banknote where, and register your love. So we will get this map where hopefully pink hearts will be uh, spreading everywhere. Well, and that's, uh, I think that's it. Thank you.